Dr Guy Robert Preston. Environmental programmes, what do you actually mean by that? Well, these are programmes that uh, we started actually when we were in water affairs. Uh, originally I was Carter Asmal's advisor and we started uh, the then Working for Water program. I was running all of the water conservation programs under water affairs and forestry at the time. And Working for Water was, despite the name, about invasive species. So it was the fact that invasive species use such a lot of water compared to the indigenous species that they displace. And, so, and, and it was a highly labor-intensive focus that we were having. So hence the name Working for Water Programme. And uh, we started off in, in water affairs. We were there for 16 years and then we moved our programme across to environmental affairs to also link up with the legislation uh, on invasive species. When we talk about regulations, are they hard cast laws that yes. exist now? They're hard cast laws. They are. Uh, regulations in terms of an act, the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act. Uh, they came into force in October last year. It's, it's very much a, a process now to build up the capacity to enforce them and to, and to also use advocacy to, to make people aware of them and what their responsibilities are. Um, but yes, they're very much in force. With legislation normally comes punishments, i.e. fines and etc. that I presume a grit goes on hand in glove. Sure. I, I, it, it's always a thing that everybody says, well, how much am I liable to be fined if I've got a, a, an alien species in my garden and I didn't know it? Well, again, you know, we're never going to win this, this battle if we go to war with the public. So as an example from your uh, previous work, you, you were in uh, Gauteng, uh, the Jacaranda capital of, of the country. We looked at that and said, Jacarandas are invasive, unquestionably, um, but, but are we going to clear all the st streets of the thousands of Jacarandas? And it just doesn't make sense. So, so you compromise and you say, in those areas, we'll allow it, we'll treat it like a plantation. Within the urban areas, you can have as many jacarandas as you like. Outside of that, we will control them. And even there, we've made some, some concessions. So the thing with invasives is once they're in a system, it's almost impossible to get them out, mm. particularly plants, because the seeds are quite disobedient. So, uh, so what we would do is, is look at long-term control plans. For long-term control, we really need to have the public with us. And so going to war with the public is, is not, going to, not going to work. But there are things that the public need to do because if, if we rely on people to, to do the right thing, in inverted commas, uh, there are a bunch of people who won't. And, and the consequences for everyone is, in many cases, unaffordable. Isn't there an element here involved called education, 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 yeah. and, and, and that's the, the, the biggest element? It's, it's a huge element, but education is difficult. Uh, you know, so you have, you have knowledge, attitudes, and behavior that you do in that kind of spectrum, and, and the one does not necessarily lead to the other in, in some cases, and, but you're competing with so much. You're competing with the whole social media, you're competing with all the other education things that are, are being tried. So you have to have this combination, but undoubtedly we need to try to make people aware that this isn't some sort of, of, of radical greeny issue that we are, are following here. This is about the fundamentals of the functioning of our life support systems. There's a thing called famine really, parthenium is the uh, the scientific name, which, which is having a, a devastating impact on, on grazing, both stock and game, but also for which humans, uh, well, a very high percentage of humans, uh, form, form a, 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 an allergy against. So you get um, blisters and things, and also, and also has a problem with, with uh, respiratory uh, things coupled with TB being a problem in northern KwaZulu where it's, from whence it's, it's invading. 
Now that is also being invaded. Uh, the, the pathway for the invasion is through cars and the tires and griddles and things of cars. So it's spreading rapidly. And it can completely take over areas. This, it can have 5,000 seeds per square, square meter. The seeds are viable for 50 years. Uh, it's allelopathic, so it, it inhibits all the other, uh, all the other plants uh, growing in there. It's a catastrophe that we are dealing with that, that we really do need to address. We need to work with the public to protect them because people are victims of the invasion in that case. There are other things where people plant, you know, so you plant a plantation, but you don't look after the, the seed, seeds that escape from your plantation and they go up into the mountains. And you can completely dry up, completely dry up a catchment. Now you go to the Southern Cape Mountains and you, and you sit there with, with all the agriculture uh, that, and all the livelihoods that are dependent on that, the B&Bs and the businesses and everything else. And if you, if you can't rely on the water security because invasives are pumping out this water like windmills up the mountains, and it's incredibly difficult getting people up into the mountains to clear. How did AIS, this, this invasive, I mean, so many plants one can talk about, how did it come to be introduced into this country? It must well, have come from overseas. Yeah, so all of them are species that evolved in other parts of, of the world and have been introduced into our country. You can also get invasions within a country, by the way, but, but these are species, the, the, the 559 that we've listed across the taxa, so not just plants, but animals and microbes too. And they've been introduced either accidentally or deliberately. So in many cases, the, the nursery industry, the, uh, the forestry industry, the pet trade industry, uh, they've seen things that interest them and they've wanted to bring them into the, into the country and either they've been given permission uh, or they've just brought them in. And, uh, and some of them are able to outcompete. So they escape their enemies and they're able to outcompete the indigenous things and can completely take over. I mean, Table Mountain has got somewhere in the region of 2,300 indigenous species, more species than, than Britain. And, uh, and it could be taken over literally by five or six species. I'm smiling here because I'm thinking of the Australians who seem to have uh, got a good stranglehold on this particular situation. Yeah. You can't take an apple into the country. You Correct. can't take anything in there. They have a thing called border control. Yeah. Uh, aren't we really saying to ourselves, or are we really saying to ourselves, we should have a border control here. Well, we uh, no we, postal items, or everything checked as well. Correct. They're very good. And the New Zealanders, we've just been on a second fact-finding tour there. I, I had to give a presentation, so I coupled it. And um, and we are setting up our own border control. Now, government is doing it generally, so it's it's going to cover a spectrum societies and drugs and all sorts of things, money laundering but also uh, invasive species. Um, but we are in, uh, at the moment setting up to complement what agriculture, forestry and fisheries has done for some time to have greater control at our border. And, and it's absolutely essential. And that certainly does include the postal service. So in New Zealand, for example, every postal item that goes through uh, is, is x-rayed. We've just bought six x-ray machines now. They're being set up right now. Uh, we've, we've, we've put 200 million rand into set, 240 million in fact, to, to set up our biosecurity capacity as part of the invasive alien species uh, regulations. I'm going to couple up a couple of questions here uh, because we've already spoken about it but, but I'd like to elucidate a little bit more on it. The impact on biodiversity, sorry, mm -hmm. and how, how can we really prevent and eradicate and control these. It, it, there's a holistic approach, which you, we talked about, but what about some simple things that can be done immediately? Well, I think the, the big thing is what you've touched on is, is we have to close that barn door. So we have to stop new species coming into the country as best we can. Uh, for plants and animals, it's viable, but for microbes, it's, it's incredibly challenging. 
um, and the microbes are, as, as we are talking off air about bird flu and, and HIV and AIDS and other things, they, they are the big long-term challenge. But uh, I, I just want to say on eradication, I mean, South Africa, on mainland South Africa, in our history, we've eradicated. In other words, it no longer occurs in our country. One species, which was at the Cape Town Harbour, a snail that was found there and, and killed, and all of them were killed. We, are, we have a bird from India called the Indian house crow, which we've, uh, we've been pursuing. I think we, we might well eradicate it, but it's so established in Mozambique and other things that it will keep coming back in. If we look at those AIS regulations, if you, it's almost difficult in an interview like this to spell them out specifically, but what does it actually say it, it, if one were to compound it and uh, give me a little profile of it? I think there are two main issues. So one is, is the border control that you spoke of. We need to try to prevent species coming into the country or at least uh, control what comes in and the conditions under which they come in, the permit that is then given. So the first component of that then is, is that we are tightening up, building up our capacities at our ports of entry. I think we have 73 or something different border posts in South Africa. I might be wrong with the figure, but it's somewhere of that order. So it's a huge, huge challenge to build up that capacity, work with the police and SARS and Customs and all the others. To, to be able to look at it and to be able to recognize things. So we're also looking at barcoding, genetic barcoding, uh, which, which is a very precise way of identification. But there are lots of things that we and the rest of the world have to jump through before we do that. There's a commercial aspect to this as well. I own a property, I want to sell a property. How do those laws affect? Okay, so that's the second component is, yes. is, is what's already in the country. So we have uh, on our list at the moment, it, it gets updated regularly, we have 379 different plant species that are invasive in parts of our country. Um, most of them will only be invasive in some parts and not all parts of the country. Uh, so in your area up the west coast, you, you might sit with 200 or whatever species that are potentially invasive on, on, on your property. And we've put those into categories. So they're, they're what we call category 1A species. And they're not widespread. And ones that we might even be able to eradicate. Um, I'm just talking plants now, but it applies to animals and microbes. Uh, and, and so in that case, what we've said is, is we want to work with the public, with social media, and with others, other, other ways of, of helping people to identify the thing because it's not easy uh, to inform us and then once we know where it is we will go and we will carry the cost of, of clearing these uh, when they do that initial clearing. What are we actually saying and I, I, I've got to stop you here because I can see somebody sitting at home thinking well I have to get a certificate of clearance for bugs in my house anyway, I have to get a certificate of clearance for electrical wiring Am I now going to have to get another certificate for this particular Well, instance? that's where we, we would like to head. Yeah. At the moment, um, what it talks of is informing people of invasives on your property. Mm. And that's an, that's an equity <coughs> issue, actually, because if, if I sell you my property and it's full of invasives and you don't know the difference, uh, and then government comes in and, and issues a directive to clear, so at the moment, around Table Mountain, we are, are issuing directives to all landowners to clear the invasives because the fires that occurred were hugely fueled by invasives. Uh, and now we run the, the Working on Fire program as well. So we had all our firefighters do a magnificent job together with the city and the province and other people uh, in fighting those fires in February. What, I, what amuses me is that you know, everyone is so positive about these firefighters, and they should be because they're brilliant, and they give them tea and cookies and everything else. But the working for water people, the people who care of the invasives, are the ones who prevented what would have been a catastrophe because we had cleared 5,000 hectares. And that, those would have burnt with an intensity that is, is tenfold that of indigenous vegetation. The person on his or her property is going to be required, even in a civil case, to, to defend 
the invasions on their property. Uh, what we already have is that we can go onto your property and clear your land at your expense and at your risk. Uh, so you may not have the plants on your, on your property. What we're saying with the Category 1A is, is tell us about it, we'll come in and clear them for you now because it's, it's like the first, the first outbreak of an invasive disease. You, you, you need to get in there and you don't want people not to tell you because they don't want to pay the cost of things. The Category 1B are the, uh, is really the big category and those are the established invasives that are basically out of control in our country. And, and those are the ones where, where landowners and farmers and, and, and others are, are probably most affected. There we're saying you have to have a control plan, you have to clear these things. The, there are a number of nuances, so once again we try not to go to war with people, but, but they do need to do it and they need to know that the sooner they do it, the less it will cost. Now, we are experts in this. We've been doing it for 20 years. We've spent billions of your taxpayers' money bringing things under control. And as a sideline there, the CSIR did an assessment of the value of the work that we've done, we and others have done. Uh, from just a water perspective, uh, a biodiversity perspective, and a grazing perspective. So we could lose, they estimated, 72% of our grazing through invasives if, if we don't control them. They came up with a return on investment of 453 billion rand. So you, you're not going to get much that's a better return on investment. But what it brings home is the stitch in time saves nine. So if you can do it quickly, then it's not expensive, certainly relative to what it will become. Uh, for farmers, if in, for many of the species, if they don't bring it under control, they will not have the productive potential of the land. They will not have water, which is a fairly fundamental need for, for any farming virtually. Um, so so it's, it's in people's own enlightenment self-interest to stop the invasions as soon as, as they can. But what they need is government to be systematic and to work through areas so that you don't have pockets of invasions from which the, 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 they spread again and all those impacts uh, happen once again. I think it's bigger than climate change even. I think it in, for the long term, and I'm talking also disease and, and, and animals, I think it's what will define life on Earth. So, Really? You actually believe it will define life on Earth, this particular well, what situation? Well, what will happen? Because, because largely it's irreversible. I mean, we are moving species around at rates that are just completely unprecedented. The, there was a study done by the Nature Conservancy in Hawaii, and they worked out prior to human settlement in Hawaii a new species, a new plant species, would, would establish on the islands every 25 to 50,000 years. They would come, go across in flotsam or be taken by a bird or something. And occasionally something would, would be able to take and survive. Now in a way, they, they, they have estimated that a new plant establishes in a way every 18 days. Now just to put it in perspective, it's like getting a new cold once a year, what was happening to now getting a new cold uh, every minute. So what you're really saying, we're losing the war? Oh, we, as a world, we are undoubtedly losing the world because so few countries are really on top of this, this issue of invasion. And it's, it's, it's a cancer. It's, you know, for, you carry on living, you've got these nuisance species, whatever they are, uh, but you deal with them because you can but then it reaches a threshold like the Indian miner that you spoke of. I mean, the Indian miner, we just could never afford to bring under control now. They've, they've been largely an urban bird, but they've now got out into, into, into the rural areas. Namibia is trying to stop them getting in there now at the moment. But, uh, but they, you know, I think, I think it's, the population has now just exploded to such a degree that our raptors and other species can't keep them under control. 
and and they of course have an impact. They're very aggressive birds. They they kill or pick out the eyes of chameleons. So one of the big impacts that they are having apparently is is on our chameleon population, which of course has a role in ecosystem functioning. But the broader statement of what I was making is really around around life support systems, the so-called ecosystem services of water, of, of, of um, the sedimentation, siltation, erosion, fire, uh, all of those impacts that, that are associated, and disease, of course. Final question. We're losing a war, and that is a, a war of the world. It's not just it impacting on South Africa. Mm. Are your counterparts in other countries in total agreement with you on this situation and what are they doing to assist? Well, uh, it's a good question because no country can do this on its own. So, you know, Australia, New Zealand, parts of the US uh, and, and increasingly many other countries are recognising and, and the Convention on Biological Diversity is very strong on the need, need for this. But really, we must be as concerned about what we are allowing into our country as what we are allowing out of our country. So we would like to have a, a situation where before you're allowed to take a species into another country, that, that you have permission from that country to, and, and an understanding of the risks. Because I mean, we, have, we don't know how many alien plant species in our country. But uh, one expert puts it at 30,000 alien. Now, we don't have a problem with alien because the notion of an alien species is it's not invasive in our terminology. It's only these 379 of that 30,000 or whatever the right figure is that we are concerned about. So what we're saying is it's not an issue of alien, it's, a, it's an issue of invasiveness. And, and that is what we need to, to do risk assessments and be sure that whatever's coming into a country is, is um, able to be controlled. It's not even that we're saying that you can't have invasive species. Our forestry industry is based on them, but we must control what they do. And I don't want to, although the war is a big one and, and a frightening one, particularly with diseases, uh, we have made extraordinary uh, advances in what we've been doing over the past 20 years through the government's uh, Department of Environmental Affairs working for water program and, and, and with incredible support from Minister Molewa and all of our previous ministers. Uh, we, we have big budgets and I think the kind of thing, I mean I'm sitting here at a, at a table that's made out of, of invasive wood. We are creating huge numbers of jobs, clearing the invasives, turning them into into wood uh, products. We, we've put 260,000 children behind a school desk in this year alone so far. We'll probably hit half a million. Uh, 260,000 is filling Soccer City three times. Uh, and there are many other products that we're looking to make using the invasives that would then help farmers and others to, to get rid of at least that initial biomass that they have on their land. Uh, there's always the follow-up work there. All right, there's one question I haven't asked you. It's the final question. Very briefly, can we win this war? Uh, I think we'll, at best, be hoping to have uh, some sort of equilibrium. Uh, you know, there, there are species that are in the country that what we call long fuse big bangs. So they take a long time to get to a point where they invade and then they explode. So, so the, the issue is really serious. Uh, I mentioned uh, off air the bird flu figures, swine flu and other things, if and when those things break, and the, the wisdom is that they will break, some form of zoonotic disease is going to have a catastrophic uh, event like we like we had with the plague and many other things with smallpox and so on. That that is something to be very scared about. Dr. Guy Preston, thank you very much. Thank you.